Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our cultural awareness webinar. My name is Fahim Akhtar. I am one of the um, Neuro Rehab and Stroke Delivery Network facilitators. Um, we are very lucky today to be joined by three presenters um, who will be taking you through three different presentations through the webinar. Um, namely, Karen Sampson will be the first, um, Khadija Amla, and then Adipa Agnihotri. So before we begin, I uh, just wanted to cover some housekeeping. Similar to previous webinars, we will have an opportunity to pose questions to our panel today via the Q&A box at the end of the webinar. We will be sharing uh, a live evaluation poll at the end as well. Please do let us know um, all your thoughts on the webinar, any comments. Please do share any ideas for future uh, events as well. And if you enjoy the webinar, please do tweet us at GMNISDN. We would like to raise the awareness everywhere. Um, future events, uh, please do consult our website. There's lots of new, new exciting webinars coming your way. And for any other inquiries, please do email Karen uh, for anything and she will be happy to help. So I will be staying with you a little bit longer this morning um, just to um, set the scene around the webinar and give you some details uh, around the background of, of this webinar and also just talk a little bit about our health inequalities programme. So I wanted to look at you know, the prevalence of, of stroke within not in the northwest. We were the second highest uh, prevalence of strokes in the whole of the country. We serve, um, you know, 11 of the top most social economically deprived areas in the northwest, including Oldham and Rochdale, our health inequalities program, um, which initially uh, looked at sort of culturally appropriate um, cardiovascular disease and prevention resources. This is what how um, we built um, our prevention program to help target um, the ethnic minorities within within our region um, and really looked at a, a cultural appropriate training and felt that that was something that really people identified with. We then, um, as a result of that, started up um, targeting the Muslim population with regards to fasting around our Ramadan campaign um, and you know we, we have been doing some work around our fast campaign to try and get that translated into different languages to see if we can uh, you know um, get um, the message out on different platforms for um, new, the numerous different um, um, diverse populations that we have um, and then we also were trying to look at this from a life after stroke um, program um, because we knew that we had issues with ethnic minorities um, to help accessing services. So we uh, looked specifically uh, at um, a listening project with the Stroke Association that we piloted um, in Fairfield, which I'll go into very, very briefly, but we presented the findings of that at our stroke conference last year. And when we did do that, that's when um, I met um, the lovely Khadija and um, I got to work with uh, Maddie from the uh, Stroke Association. And that's really how this um, conversation sort of started um, on how we wanted to try and build something that helped our professionals um, to be more culturally aware. Um, and we are hoping to go forward and do some more work around communication um, and with your help and your feedback, um, look at um, any other aspects of, of um, cultural awareness or any other webinars that we might need to put together to try and help you um, feel a little bit more confident around these kind of conversations. Working with the Stroke Association, we targeted Fairfield Hospital. We felt that that was um, where the, there was quite a lot of diversity um, and wanted to include um, you know, areas that had um, diverse ethnicity and um, deprivation. So the aim of the project was to learn about um, stroke survivors from their personal experiences. But through that, I think the Stroke Association also spoke to some of our professionals. Um, and the aim was to just to understand potential barriers with uh, within the health inequalities, within health inequalities. So the project found that there 
you know, stroke professionals um, had insufficient levels of understanding um, regarding ethnicity and culture. Um, a lot of participants felt um, they had issues around recognising stroke and symptoms, and we've done some targeted work around that um, already. So professionals themselves also felt um, a similar uh, lack of knowledge um, and felt that they you know, weren't able to support their patients from an ethnic minority due to um, a lack of understanding. Um, and therefore we have uh, put together um, at this webinar um, with a little bit more of a structure um, and try to give people uh, more of an understanding around ethnicities and culture. I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, ethnicity, um, which um, is a state of social belonging. Um, is some, it's, it's commonly used with somewhere um, that you're nationally from um, and it can be based on your um, identity. Um, and we're going to look at culture in a bit more detail in Carol's presentation which will be next. I just wanted to look at the 18 character, uh, categories that are recorded within SNAP um, around stroke patient ethnicity and you can see on the left hand side the national percentage of breakdown of different ethnicities and then the percentage within our regions of the hospitals within the regions that the hospitals serve so if we're looking at Fairfield, um, the black population is 1.8 in Fairfield, it's just one. Um, but if you look at the Asian population in Fairfield, it's 9.4%, which increases again when you look in, uh, fifth, um, in Manchester and it looks at 15.5%. Um, and the black population increases to 12.9%. So I think even within SNAP and the recording of ethnicities, it isn't um, it isn't brilliant, but it just gives us a bit of a starting point um, and shows us the variety and diversity of ethnicity within our region that we serve. So thinking about um, the diverse populations that we serve, it brings us on to the conversation around communication. The project also found that language was a, a, an important thing that wasn't being captured. Patients weren't feeling supported um, and weren't able to access support because the language was a barrier. Therefore, it recommended that professionals communicate this better uh, in both written and spoken forms. And we will be covering that in a bit more detail with the patient story that we have um, included in our webinar. And this brings us to our cultural awareness webinar today, the learning outcomes of which uh, will centre around the importance of culture, the uh, increased awareness of diverse cultures and values within the workplace, and to help understand how culture then helps us shape our um, rehabilitation goals and our services to improve patient care. So without further ado, I will um, introduce our first presenter, which is um, Carol who will be talking to you about the importance of culture and, uh, and value-based goal setting. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carol Sonson, consultant clinical neuropsychologist. Today, I'm talking about culture and values in neurorehabilitation. I run um, Integrity Neuropsychology Services. I'm the founder, and this is a community interest company that was set up to deliver neuropsychology through community based partnerships, um, interventions, and also to promote and support uh, in, in neuropsychology informed services and practices. I want to just acknowledge uh, some of the and talk about you know, the limitations of the presentation today, which might seem a funny place to start, but it's self-awareness and self-care is important, especially when we're talking about difficult subjects, such as, you know, that can bring up, um, you know, um, strong feelings, things around, um, around race, ethnicity, um, social justice, etc. So I'm just going to read this out. Self-awareness and self-care, they're important because as we discuss these issues, the discussion may provoke feelings and thoughts of helplessness, anger, guilt, 
resignation and even um, cynicism. We do have such a thing as, you know, um, burnout, sort of that's, um, that sense of helplessness that the, you know, people can feel if if they are put in having to, we have to self-examine and, and it brings up these feelings. So it's important to acknowledge these thoughts and feelings if they come up for us, for you, for me, and to seek out trusted support to help us process the thoughts and feelings in a safe space. I also want to reference the importance of some of the areas that are not, we're not able to do justice to, to to today, such as the concept of race as a politically constructed concept, the idea of microaggressions, which obviously speak to the more subtle interactions that there can be between people of different ethnicities, um, where you're not quite sure whether there's a racial undertone to it. Um, the idea of white privilege and white as and the Eurocentric view as the default perspective. These are some areas which I, I acknowledge are um, important and also I've got to include um, biases, whether they're, they're um, unconscious or conscious bias. They are important areas, but they're not ones we're going to have the time to deep dive into. So conversations about culture um, matter. Why do they matter? One of the reasons they matter is because meeting the cultural needs of someone is not as easy as it may look. It is more than a culturally appropriate hospital food. Although I did have a recent positive experience of, in this area when my dad was taken into hospital and he was offered um, a Caribbean diet, which wasn't up to my mum's standards, but I thought it was a really good um, step in the right direction to give him a choice and making sure that their choice appropriate one for his needs and his preferences. The other reason why these conversations around culture and value is, are important is that the research is still showing that people from ethnic minoritized communities are at a higher risk of developing health conditions such as high blood pressure, diabetes and other things that put them at risk of strokes. Also, the lack of accessible information about health promoting habits, such as diet and exercise and more um, health reducing ha um, habits is not, um, is not available to people often. So things just look information in, in the person's own language, for example. The, the health disparities are uh, well recognized, um, as are the social determinants of health such as um, education and employment inequalities and social and economic disparities as well. And this is information that's available from Public Health England and the Health Foundation as well. It's done a recent report, fairly recent report on the social determinants of health. So the importance and influence of culture. Macintosh 2019 reminds us that all human beings have the culture, regardless of their ethnicity and their racial background. In addition, the um, DSM-5 has a broad ranging definition of culture. So I'll read it out. It says systems of knowledge, concepts, rules and practices. So this is what culture is, that are learned and transmitted across generations this includes, but it's not exclusive to, language, religion and spirituality, family structures, life cycle stages, rituals, customs, moral and legal systems. So that is quite a broad range in um, definition. It encompasses lots of different areas that can impact and influence and contribute to a person's cultural identity. We can also think of um, our own personal or individual identities and factors that make us, the intersection between various factors that make us who we are, regardless of our ethnicity and our culture, but then also think about how that um, plays out in our interactions in, with, our, with the stroke patients and other people in our, in our rehab space. So 
This is the um, the uh, dimensions of diversity, which is a model or a tool for thinking about this, those intersectionalities between various factors that you will recognise as representing cultural um, aspects of a person or of, of us as individuals and other factors and the more wider um, kind of social, economic and other factors. So we're talking about things like religion, which I've just mentioned. We're also talking about other factors like, and another bit deeper dive into religion in other presentations and the impact in the rehab setting. But we're also talking about gender influences, sexual identity, economic and class um, in, you know, kind of factors and how they interplay abilities and this or different abilities um, as well. So a number of factors that help us and kind of influence us how we decide who we are. Bearing that in mind, I want to just do a bit of self-reflection and to ask ourselves the following questions. Question, I should say. Have you reflected on your own cultural beliefs and values and how they impact on your assumptions and interactions with people from a different cultural or ethnic background? So self-reflection is important because if you haven't self-reflected, you don't know um, what's influencing directly how you feel about particular um, clients or service users, why, why you react in a certain way to things they, they say or do, their behaviours, um, and how they re react to you. So, so that process of self-reflection, um, self-examination is um, important. So why take time for self-reflection? I've already mentioned um, a couple of the factors because, because of the interaction between um, you know, ourselves and our service users. And, and, but I would just from my own personal experience, I just want to share why I, I think it's important to take time for, for self-reflection. Um, so it's my personal story um, as a junior psychologist, newly qualified, and we know how it is that we get, um, you know, we're anxious anyway. We're not sure we know what we're doing. You know, I'm sure this applies for other therapists as well. But for me, all those years ago, I didn't have many clients or team members who looked like me. So when I was doing my initial meetings with, with new clients, I always had an experience, I always experienced um, anxiety. And um, this played out in me um, having thoughts about what they think about me. Would they be surprised when they saw that Carol Sampson, the psychologist, was actually a black woman? because I've got an anglicised name, um, what, would be, what would their expectations be? What would their prejudgments of me be? Um, and what were my prejudgments of, of, of um, the service users? So this caused me to go on a bit of a journey of self-reflection, of trying to increase my knowledge about what I was bringing to the table when I was um, interacting with my service users. This was this, this was part of as a journey. I did at times feel quite helpless. I did at times feel anxious. Um, and I think now on reflection, things could have been put into place. And I and part of it, and one of the things would have been a webinar like this, where we would have had the chance to discuss key issues, thoughts, feelings, um, uh, look at what we bring into that into the rehab space as individual clinicians and what our service users, the people we serve, bring into that space as well. Okay, I don't feel like that <laughs> anymore, generally speaking. So the, there's the importance of us being all that we are. We each bring into the rehab space all that we are, even though we don't always know that because we have our professional objective head on. But some parts of us are, or our clients may not be directly accessible. People won't want to talk about all the things that concern them, all the, the experiences they've had that have impacted on where they are at now, how they're presenting. They might 
that might not be for that might not be for one um, session. It might be a, a whole process, a whole series of conversations. But we do know that cultural beliefs and values will influence the interactions, every interaction in the rehabilitation space. So talking about values, what are values? I think um, I'm making an assumption here, but um, so I'm assuming that most of us have talked about values, uh, you know, with our, with the service users or as in a team, and we and we, and we are uh, using or thinking about um, value based goal setting with our service users. And I think Deepak is going to be looking at that more in his um, presentation. So values are statements about what we want to be doing with our life. And this is from Russ Harris's book, from Act Made Simple and Act Being Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Values are about what we want to stand for, how we want to behave on an ongoing basis. So they are our leading or guiding principles that can guide us and motivate us as we move through life. So although a person's culture and values are often closely linked, we cannot assume this is the case due to the processes, well, due to processes such as acculturation. And by that, some of you may have heard of acculturation, you may have heard of assimilation in relation to culture. So this is defined um, by Nehemiah as cultural and psychological changes happening in ethnic populations or different populations as a result of interactions with the majority racial ethnic population. And as I said, assimilation is just one expression of this process of acculturation and it can occur at different levels and it can it determines the difference between, for example, first, second and third generation uh, members of a, of a family of that have um, immigrated from one country into another country and into a different kind of socio-economic um, political context. And at the moment we're seeing that with say people who've come over from Hong Kong and people who've come over from the Ukraine. So using that example of the people from the Ukraine in terms of culture, they it, well, and wait, it, there's a disconnect with skin colour, is that the culture they have doesn't doesn't um uh, the culture they 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 bring uh, as white people is very different from a British-born white, um, a UK-born white person. I say. So, if we're looking at culture, a worldview, and values, we can start. The starting point is always will always be somebody's culture and values. Um, and this will shape their worldview, their views about, um, you know, about the world and how people should behave and what type of world we're living in, what type of society, etc. So the, the fact is that impact on this, I've done this as a walkthrough really, so it's not a line linear process, but it's just a walkthrough, a conversational walkthrough that you might use as a you know, a starting point really to help you frame the discussions around culture and values in the rehab setting. So we're looking at the impact of such, such things as spirituality and faith, impact of the family setting, um, the community context, how much contact people have with their, their own communities and the wider community, employment, what's, what has been a person's experience of um, of uh, employment, of getting work, of uh, retaining work, have there been any uh, kind of considerations around kind of racial um, issues that come come from that experience, their educational experience, what's you know the housing and the, and if, is, there, is there is there a context in the housing that that has affected um, them the quality of life in any way. All these factors are important if we're taking a whole person approach. However, we need to bear in mind that asking questions about any one aspect of these areas can be experienced as intrusive. And for example, in some cultures, family or lifestyle type of information may be considered private 
and not for the rehab records or the or for MDT discussion. Another important consideration when we're looking at race, culture, ethnicity and values is to, to look at things from a trauma informed perspective. So taking any trauma related considerations um, in, you know, sorry, any trauma related factors into consideration, including the effects of cumulative trauma. This could be racial trauma due to systemic racist experiences that the person has gone through. This could be due to war and conflict related trauma in the case of the um, U Ukraine refugees. And also we have the trauma, um, particularly the psychological trauma of experiencing a stroke. So the ABI experience. So therefore, the, tra the trauma sensitive approach is vital and necessary to underpin and support the conversations we have with people around race, culture, values, etc. Yeah, OK, so let's try to move this on now. One of the things to consider is what's important to the person and we know that that's that's a given, um, but what what are we talking about in terms of what's important to the person? So we're looking at in terms of um, guiding principles, always seeking permission um, before we ask for the factors mentioned before that certain areas from a cultural perspective may not be um, you know may not be in limits as such. And we need to, we're going to respect and honour this. But there may be different ways. So a person um, may not want to talk to you about their, their kind of what's going on in their family, for example, but they may allow another member of the family to, to share some information with you with, with their permission. Or it might be something that's important from, let's say, uh, a religious point of view. There are certain practices that you may not be aware of, certain things that are important to them. Uh, and they may they may allow a community group or a community kind of elder or, or spokesperson to be involved and speak on their behalf. And that might be a slightly different and more uncomfortable way of doing rehabilitation. Um, but if that worked, if that is something that can work in the terms of um, influencing the, com the um, communication between us and our people we serve, then we need to be open and flexible to outreaching to community groups to see how they can support us in, our, in developing our knowledge and skills around different cultural groups. And I think that's one of the reasons for um, one of the reasons why we shy away from this area, we shy away from the conversations with people about their culture, about their, um, you know what's in, what is important to them in that aspect, because we're afraid of getting it wrong. We're afraid of causing offence. But the fact of the matter is that I don't know about everybody who walks into my room. I don't know all the details about the, all the different cultures and the expressions of culture. Uh, that people bring to the table in the rehab setting. I don't know and I don't expect to know, but I but but I do it, but we do know it's important for us to do our research to um, find out about different cultures, especially if we're working in a in a very culturally diverse um, part of the uh, part of the country. So always seek permission, but be prepare to be flexible in, in, in how you get that information once you get the permission. Secondly, we make no assumptions. So if we have two people coming into the room and they're the same skin colour, let's say the same assumed ethnicity, um, we can't assume that they have the same religious practice, for example, or they eat the same foods, for example, or what's important to one person from that if one individual will be the same for another. Can't make those assumptions. Um, so we're basically starting with a clean slate, but an informed clean slate. So we're, and then thirdly, we aim for inclusive conversations. I had a discussion about this on um, some mental health training I did the other day in culturally appropriate mental health interventions. 
and the discussion was around inclusive conversations, making sure that people who are usually marginalised, and this could be because of their um, ethnicity, their culture, their values, this disability and other, you know, their sexuality, that they, the conversations we have um, are inclusive of, of, of what they want, what they see as important, what their perspective is. In the rehab setting, this can be a bit of a challenge, particularly around the goal setting part of it, um, because somebody's goal for us might seem um, not smart, i.e. not achievable, not attainable, etc. Um, but as we rehab professions, we know we have the duty to make our conversations uh, inclusive of every aspect of that person's kind of needs and values. So my, my conclusion thoughts are framed as questions or challenges as we seek to continue the conversation. So how can we as rehabilitation professionals move towards a more culturally sensitive services? What actions can you take to contribute to this process? So what do you think are the challenges and barriers to making change happen? Hopefully that's given you some food for thought and I'd like to thank you for um, taking time to listen to this. I've just put a few references on, just a brief, a brief um, reference list. So first of all, a mini plug, I've got a chapter in this book, Systemic, Systemic Approaches to Brain Injury Treatment, Navigating Contemporary Practice. So that's a link, but I think you might have to copy and paste it into your browser to get it to work. Also, in my talk, I've referenced um, Yumoto's book, Multicultural Neurorehabilitation, Neuro Clinical Principles for Rehabilitation Professionals. Now, I found that a very useful resource that I think would be helpful if you were wanting to explore this area of multicultural neurorehabilitation in, in more depth than I've been able to cover today. And, and also the Public Health England documentation that I mentioned earlier. And then there are other resources. Um, the Health Foundation have things on resources on um, the social determinants of um, health as well. If you want to contact me, my contact details are that, that are here, spelled out here, admin at insmuro.co.uk, the main contact detail. I'm happy to, to continue the conversation with um, some, you know, with you if you if you want to speak about things on a more one-to-one -one basis. Thank you. My name is Deepak Agnotri. My pronouns are him, he, him and his. I'm a physiotherapist and advanced clinical practitioner currently working as a national clinical advisor for learning disabilities in autism. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk to you about cultural awareness today. My goals are to, to talk about person-centered rehabilitation goals and how diversity and inclusive culture leads to positive outcomes for the patients. Today, uh, my focus will be specifically looking at the females and from the Asian and Afro-Caribbean backgrounds. However, I just wanted to focus and say that under the Equality Act, there are nine protected characteristics, which includes age, sex, sexual orientation, gender, religion or belief, disability, race, marriage and civil partnership, maternity and pregnancy. And we may need to look at reasonable adjustments according to the protected characteristics. One of the things that has been talked about is provision of equality or equal opportunities. However, we are now moving towards equity and inclusion. Depending on the protected characteristics, we may have to do reasonable adjustments depending on the background, whether it's race, whether it's disability, whether it's age. If you see the picture in the middle, if you provide some positive action in relation to giving the reasonable adjustments, you will be able to achieve equity and inclusion so that it, so that nobody is left behind. That is the same in stroke 
rehabilitation because most of the time uh, we have patients who are from diverse ethnicities or have disabilities or any other protective characteristics. They are left like a person on a wheelchair because there is a box that is provided. For example, yes, we have done the pathway. We have done uh, the protocol, but it has not been aligned or it has not included what are the basic needs or what we call the person centered needs of the patient to make them inclusive. However, we have to move towards liberation where we can actually remove the barriers and treat everyone as equal and provide the opportunities for good rehabilitation for each and every patient who unfortunately has stroke. So just to give you some idea why we are talking about it and why the cultural awareness is so important. Stroke has a bigger impact on women than men. And if it is talking about the people uh, from Afro-Caribbean and South Asian heritage, they, there is a higher prevalence of <coughs> conditions and underlying comorbidities which make them more vulnerable at higher risk of having stroke. And in terms of uh, the prevalence is 2.2% higher among the black community compared to the white population. And here is an interesting fact. If it is uh, the mortality rate, if we look at the people who are dying, if there are men who were born in West Africa, they are two and a half times more likely or higher have mortality rate than people with the black community born in England and Wales. So that th this highlights that even though that people are from the same ethnicity, or a background, they will still have changes. And that's one of the spectrum I'm going to talk about is even though there is a higher prevalence of uh, stroke among Afro-Caribbean and South Asian population, there is a spectrum that it affects differently to males compared to females. So uh, why am I talking about this and why my focus is on specifically at females from Asian and Afro-Caribbean? Because I, in my experience, I had a female patient who is a 56 year old Indian female. Uh, she was married. She had no children. She was living with a husband, very, very caring husband. Unfortunately, she had a stroke and uh, she suffered with right sided hemiplegia and she was right hand dominant and she used to do every work. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the recovery that is not only related to biosocial uh, psychosocial characteristics, but also related to the social recovery aspects of it. The family, the carers and the social relationships that play a major role in the recovery of a person. Uh, I'm going to talk about how it has affected the person's sense of autonomy and how as a person who is a wife, a mother, who has been a grandmother or a housewife and a different perspectives, how they perceive the world and their disability in terms of that anyway. We will talk about some of the physical functioning. I'm a physiotherapist, so uh, my goal is to look at some of the aspects which are related to improving the function so that people have uh, a better rehabilitation, but as well as social satisfaction in terms of recovery. Why cultural sensitivity is important? Because uh, in terms of females, there is an added pressure or you can say the cultural aspects of that that has been brought up because of their upbringing, because of the heritage and the culture they have been. And another important aspect is marriage and caring and the responsibility that people see themselves in. In terms of uh, the patient that I'm talking about, she was a homemaker and she had a very high sense of pride in looking after her family, her husband and providing. And when that uh, she had a stroke, it affected her badly because she lost all sense of her identity or the purpose why she was there. So when we talk about the principles of person centered care, these are applicable to all regardless of people with protected characteristics or not, because that was the four principles given by Health Foundation. And first is affording people with compassion, dignity and respect. These are the basic rights 
that in the NHS constitution that has been given and that everybody needs to uphold. If it is about offering care, support and treatment, we know there has been discrepancies in terms of people who are getting the treatment or access to the treatment, whether due to language barriers, whether due to not understanding the health and social care as a system. So we have to look at how we can improve the coordination and actually how we can include the family members and the carers in the cultural aspects of that and what the family role and the social relationships play in providing person centered care for people from uh, protected characteristics or diverse ethnicities. So then next part is offering personalized care, support and treatment. I'll touch up a little bit on the about the emotional aspects of it and the uh, social and the practical needs of the person and the role of carers. In this instance, and uh, the husband, he was very, very caring. He looked after uh, uh, really, really well in terms of providing the emotional support, social support and with the rehabilitation when it is to do with following an exercise program. Enabling, and I think this is the most important part for us. It's actually looking at providing how we can focus on developing uh, people's own strengths. But before we can look at developing own strengths, we have to look at why and what is the reason for people behaving or not behaving, engaging or not engaging with the services. Because once we understand that, hopefully by the end, you would have a little bit more understanding of the cultural awareness side of it so that you can actually make the goals specific to the people's need, making them, helping them in living their independent and fulfilling life. So there's a st uh, study done by Morley in 2012 and uh, looked at specifically life after stroke and the aspects of personal, social and cultural factors. Uh, th they looked at the uh, quantitative and qualitative study both and looked at the specific of Afro-Caribbean experience and uh, the themes that come out were majority was eight and they had uh, females uh, from the age of 58 to up to 86. That's where different range groups and some people who came from a Windera generation, which had a very strong working ethic. So there was a sense that work gives them purpose. And when they had a stroke, they actually left that. But after that, they were able to uh, support people with that and making sure that they got the meaning out of it. Most important thing which has already been touched on previously is the spirituality and a way of maintaining health. After that, one of the important aspects that uh, females from Afro-Caribbean background uh, talked about was listening to their body and the rehabilitation goals and the importance of rehabilitation goal related to their experience of previous occupation, whatever the industry they have worked in. And most important, the two important aspects was work ethics and family values, how important it is to them. And when it is to the rehabilitation, it was more important to them. For example, ability to go to market or to see the food that they used to eat uh, uh, in terms of the indigenous and then uh, homelands. And obviously one of the important aspects is preparation of the food and cooking. One of the most debilitating factors that comes into play when we are doing rehabilitation is the pain and the perception of pain because there has been a mixed evidence suggesting that there is a perceived bias and discrimination uh, when it is about the perception of pain among racial and ethnic minorities. Now there has been false beliefs and implicit bias that may be uh, driving some of the aspects of that is, for example, that you should not be seen to have pain. You cannot be seen to have a weaker establishment to say when you report pain, it shows your weakness. Along with that, there has been some factors uh, related to, for example, language barriers. When people's first language is not English and they are come across first after stroke, you know, uh, 
Uh, we have already talked about the lack of the dysphasia uh, relating to the language barriers, but when they are relating back to how would they perceive pain and what are the words they would describe whether the pain is affecting it. Then we have something called system challenges, which is about lack of access to interpreting services. And in terms of some of the times is perception of the pain and health literacy. How if you tell us about the pain, we can actually treat it and if we can treat it, this will help with the movement. Now there is a lack of understanding uh, that if we show pain or we ask for pain and the medication, it may have a negative impact on us and which will lead to uh, not adhering to the treatment when it has been given. So these are some of the factors when it is related to pain, but if we are going to have a rehabilitation goal, whether it's related to sitting, balancing, uh, walking or upper limb movements, it is very, very important to consider pain and how you can ask for it. You can actually look at the pictures. You can look at the adapting uh, some of the photographs related to pain and the perception of pain and include uh, the asking and what is the reason and rationale behind it. That may help an increased engagement and deeper telling more about pain. So looking back onto the four principles of person centered care, we have got the first one is treating with dignity and respect. Now it is the principle applies to all, but it is more responsibility that we have to look at the specific aspect of when uh, in my case I am a physiotherapist who is a male and treating a female patient and initially there was some hesitation because culturally we have been uh, in a sense that may not the females may not be as comfortable uh, in talking to the males or actually uh, not letting them touch uh, because of their nature and the expectations that they have and how they feel and uh, that in terms of for example even speaking to some of the questions so it was very uncomfortable for me being from an Indian background as an Indian physiotherapist, even treating an Indian female. But what it has to do was it had to increase awareness when I spoke to the husband and made sure that the husband is part of the, every conversation, even though explaining the rationale. Why am I doing it? What am I doing? Or if I'm asking a question, what is the reasoning behind it as well? So one of the important aspects that we have to look at is uh, look at the religious traditional beliefs and the uh, look at the sensitivity beyond the race and gender. As a, a professional, we look at it professionally, but when the patients are coming from diverse ethnicities, they may not see these things and they may not understand where, what the roles of professionals are. So it might be better for us to actually explain the reasoning and rationale so that we get increased engagement and compliance with treatment plan when we treat people with dignity and respect and understand uh, the backgrounds. So one of the important aspects of that was acceptance of a disability because of what their experiences are from their backgrounds. Uh, females specifically are looked at that they cannot be seen to have a disability or a limp or a perception of body image and that made it much more harder. And I'll give you an example. Post stroke, uh, the patient as a part of my rehabilitation had reduced strength and reduced function of upper limb and a lower limb. But when I asked, OK, what is it that you want to do? She did not want it to wear a T-shirt or a jeans or a trouser. She wanted to wear a sari. For the sari, this is what a depiction of that is. It needed a lot more upper limb function, lower limb function, core strength. And when I said, OK, we are not going to do any more exercises. Let's see how we can drape a sari or let's look at working on the processes to actually drape a sari. She automatically came into being and started to say, OK, I said I don't know how to wear a sari. So she started teaching me how to wear a sari in that function. She was engaging. She knew the purpose that why we are doing this and after that uh, we after working a couple of weeks time she was able to wear the sari and you can see the sense of pride that came back to her you can see how she was able and then she saw the meaning of strength upper leg movement functions whatever clinically that i wanted to do but i had a very 
specific goal that OK, I'll teach you how to wear a sari. That is how I was able to engage and meet my rehabilitation goals. The next important aspect which was important to her was uh, cooking and feeding and even the study that was done by Morley in 2012 stated that feeding and food preparations are key aspects of independence and self preservation. But for that you needed uh, more of an aspect of how to do it. So for example, making a chapati, you may have to do more kneading, you may have to do more rolling. And even though if you're not able to do it, same things about eating, you may not need to use knife and fork every day because in Indian household, we may use uh, hands to eat our food. That is what I took into consideration and I said, OK, what is the next goal that you want to do? And she wanted to actually prepare food. So we started looking at how we can go to the shop. So how we can go to the shop because it was important to her, given that she does not want to be seen as disabled, given that she was reluctant to use a Zimmer frame or a walking stick, I used a shopping trolley. And from that point of view, I said, OK, we are going to go to the shop, look at the vegetables that you want to do and then see whether you, we can actually make him at home because shopping has been very important aspects of her life, whether it's about giving her sense of socializing, chatting to people or making friends. Those are very, very important aspects of that. So when I was looking all those aspects of it, I was listening to her adapting my goals to her specific needs and at the end, at the end we were able to get her walking using the shopping trolley and wearing the sari and the main goal was to cook food and I'm pleased to say at the end she was able to cook the food and invited me or brought some food so that I can have some taste of it as well. So one of the important aspects of that was um, um, effects of dual tasks. So uh, I did a stroke. I did a 2D, 3D gait analysis on to the stroke survivors uh, in 2012, which was published in 2014, and it looked at the effects of dual task when people are having a falls. Uh, most of our rehab is are on the straight lines or up and down the stairs. We don't even look at considering how uh, we are training people when they are uh, turning or chatting or speaking to someone and doing something else. And uh, we were able to identify that the gate parameters do change when people are having a dual task, whether it's a mental maths or speaking to somebody and when they are turning and that led to increased amount of falls. So that's another aspect of that when we are making the goals specific to uh, the patient's needs. We have to look at all aspects of care, whether it's about walking, turning or uh, even though going up and down the stairs. So how to provide a person centered care? I have given you some of the aspects of that but it understand the cultural vocabulary that people understand the language. For example, it may be some of the important aspects for people is hand function. For example, how to greet somebody uh, saying Namaste or sitting on the floor for praying. If you can identify what is it that people's religious beliefs, spirituality or the understanding depending on their age, it's you will be able to tailor your person centered goal so that people are able to engage. Just to summarize, I wanted to sh say that this is just to give you an insight of one cultural household on one protected characteristics. There is a lot more that we have to do regarding uh, including all protected characteristics. You do not have to understand and get to know each and every aspect of it as long as you apply the principles of person centered care and the, the te teachers of helping you in those understanding cultural aspects are the patients and their carers because if you speak to them, you may not know their each and every heritage and upbringing, but if you ask them, it will help you to learn more about what are their customary practices are, what is it that helping them to engage, whether it's food, whether it's dress, uh, whether it's uh, you can apply the same principles of person centered care to any individual, but having increased awareness, 
will help you understand uh, make the recovery better. You, the, it starts with ability to listen to the patient and understanding that if you have inclusive culture, then you will be able to improve the health and social care as a system which will provide better person centered care. If you have any questions, please contact me. These are my contact details. Thank you so much for listening. Hi everyone, I'm Khadija. I'm a speech and language therapist working with stroke patients at Fairfield General Hospital. And my role today in the webinar is to talk through a gentleman that I worked with who had cultural needs during his stroke rehab. Um, he had significant speech and language um, deficits, which um, as a Muslim lost the lost his ability to pray again. And whilst I speak specifically from the speech and language therapy background and hopefully don't get too stuck in the linguistics <laughs> and uh, also to do with um, the religious and ethnic um, needs in particular, um, hopefully it can be generalised across different professions and also for different protective characteristics as well. Um, I always do a bit of a disclaimer when I speak professionally that I'm a speech therapist who hates to speak, um, but I do think this is an important story to tell. Um, this patient um, helped us to think about the gaps in services um, in meeting the needs of different patients and also um, how life after stroke services can be better equipped to serve these needs. So, so Ibrahim, um, Ibrahim was a 74 year old gentleman who had a stroke during the last uh, phases of COVID. Um, his symptoms post stroke involved um, swallowing difficulties, which resolved um, cognitive difficulties, so delayed processing, uh, fine motor difficulties um, in his hand, um, but most, um, most pronounced were his speech and language problems. Um, he was admitted onto acute, an acute stroke unit in Greater Manchester and began um, therapy with the inpatient team there, but family were quite keen to get him home as quickly as possible. He de developed really low mood whilst he was an, an inpatient and um, I think family uh, not being able to be with him was one reason, but the biggest reason was that Ibrahim was a Muslim and prayers were the most important thing to him and the biggest loss to him post-stroke. Um, and it wasn't something he could engage with in whilst he was an inpatient. Um, so, you know, the hospital team agreed to um, allow him to go home to help his, his mood and um, general well-being. Um, at the time, the community waiting list was quite long for, for Ibrahim, as advised by the, the therapists at the hospital. Um, so the family tried to find a private speech therapist um, specifically to help him with the goal of praying again. Um, and that's how they connected with me. So I'm obviously a stroke speech therapist. I also happen to have a bit of a background in Islamic sciences. So um, yeah, um, I was able to, to get involved with his therapy. Um, one of the key messages though, throughout this webinar is that um, when we think about cultural awareness, it's not that every clinician needs to be from the same background as the patient. Um, or that any cl every clinician needs to be aware of every single culture, language and see protected characteristic at every, any given time. But it's just knowing um, that we should be, feel comfortable to think creatively, think outside the box, be able to ask questions and to be able to think um, about who we're serving and involve the relevant specialist services alongside the therapist, specialist therapy input that we can offer. Um, so if it wasn't that, you know, they couldn't find a speech therapist with my kind of background, it would be working with someone with a background of Islamic sciences and and uh, specialist stroke therapy um, knowledge to be able to to help Ibrahim reach his goals. Um, to give a bit of a background about Ibrahim and the extent of his speech and language therapy um, deficits and how we adapted it to help him with his goals, he was actually diagnosed with three separate speech and language deficits, so apraxia of speech, so he had difficulty um, coordinating the articulators used for speaking, so when Ibrahim was trying to say a sound for a word, he would have difficulty correctly pronouncing it. 
Um, he also had dysarthria, so that the uh, muscles involved in speaking were weaker, so his speech sounded a lot more unclear. Um, and he had aphasia, so he had receptive language difficulties, um, difficulties processing complex information um, and following complex commands. And also um, he, he was making errors in the word choices he was choosing, so semantic errors to do with meaning. Um, and also um, he had word finding difficulties, so he was trying to think of a word, but it was a tip of the tongue sensation. Um, we are going to show um, a video of, of him explaining his story to towards the end and you'll see one strategy he used right from the start actually um, and still does is a technique called circumlocution so when he couldn't um, get the words that he wanted he was able to quite um, cleverly talk around the subject um, to get his point across. Um, after his um, three weeks as an inpatient he was sent home and um, he was given some therapy to, to start with. He went home with a communication booklet to help communicate basic needs. He was given um, some speech sound exercises working as simple as correct production of single sounds, so ma, pa, ba. Um, and he was also given some uh, therapy tasks looking at helping him produce more spontaneous speech, so phrase completion, um, where there's an example here of there's a start of a sentence and he has to try and um, finish it off with, with picture support. So you can see Ibrahim was working at a very low level um, to start with um, and that's, that's when I met him. Already at this point, there are some cultural considerations um, to consider uh, that could have been made. So um, prior to his stroke, Ibrahim actually spoke English, Gujarati and Urdu um, and it's quite known that after a stroke multilingual um, speakers um, can often revert back to one of the language languages or one language can recover um, um, in, a, in a more stronger way. So for him it was Urdu and family picked up on this that he was reverting back to his, his first language. And um, whilst the inpatient team focused rehab on the English side, it could have been useful at this point to involve an interpreter to assess um, you know, all of his languages to make sure that we are seeing the best that he can do um, in the assessment phase. So when I saw him, um, I, I noticed he was often code switching from um, English to Urdu when he couldn't find the right word in English, which kind of suggests that his word finding wasn't so severe because he was able to get the word in a different language. Um, just a way to show that, you know, make sure we are assessing according to the patient's baseline. Um, and again, I don't actually speak Urdu, I used family as a way to bridge the gap. So um, you don't personally need to know every single thing that the patient does, um, but just make sure that you are accessing all the services and resources available to you to make sure you're giving them the best chance. Um, another example um, unrelated to Ibrahim, but on the same um, line of, of knowing the patient's baseline is um, prior to working at Fairfield, I worked in Wigan, which has um, a predominantly um, ethnic, ethnically white population. Um, so cultural uh, needs around language or ethnic minorities wasn't the focus um, at, at that time. Um, but it was historically a mining town with um, lower educational levels for the aging population. So um, it was quite clear that the staff um, at, at that trust um, adapted assessments accordingly and knew that when we were assessing them against national norms, um, the patients there wouldn't always score at the same level and we should analyse that accordingly um, to give them the best chance. Um, another point brought up when I was working with Ibrahim um, was knowing the norms and values of, um, of the demographics that you're serving. So, um, I come from a similar cultural and religious background, but if I didn't, it would be useful to research at this stage, you know, what is, is normal and what were their values. Um, so knowing that in South Asian culture, family is, is a big part of, um, of society. And I knew that they would be very keen to, to know what's going on at every stage and be involved in the therapy, um, in the therapy process. Um, in which case I could, I did talk them through what I was doing and how they could help and what role they could have um, in therapy. 
Um, another thing to know about Ibrahim is he kept saying he wanted to pray as a girl again. And if you are serving a demographic with, with a lot of Muslim patients, it would be useful to know what, what that meant specifically. So um, for Muslims, um, praying involves the five daily prayers, which um, we learn as children and become obligatory on you as adults. It involves um, being in a secluded space and going in certain postures, reciting Arabic as a way to connect with God five times a day. Um, as children, we also learn to read the Arabic script um, and recite that. You might learn some of these parts by heart as well um, that are easier to learn. Um, and another role that Ibrahim had in his community was he actually did the call to prayer. Um, so this is a role that some people are chosen to do where um, before each prayer time, um, they call out some verses in Arabic um, to alert the people in the mosque and in the community that it's time for prayer. And it's a very respected position in the community and something Ibrahim really proud, prided himself on. And um, not being able to do that was a huge loss. Um, to him. So by taking the time to learn about this kind of background would make it so much easier to tailor therapy um, and to understand why he was feeling so low about not being able to do it. Um, and also just building a good therapeutic relationship with the patient, just knowing a bit more about them and where they come from and, and what's important to them. So um, Ibrahim did talk fondly about an experience in hospital where a nurse was asking him about his role as, as the person who called to prayer. Um, and, you know, it made him feel so, so much more comfortable and made him feel much more at ease talking about his interests and opening up um, to the nurse as well. Um, and, you know, giving him that space in hospital could have opened up so many more doors for um, you know, care, care for him, basically. So um, knowing his background services like chaplaincy could have been involved where even if um, therapists and medical staff weren't able to engage in the kind of conversation topics Ibrahim was interested in, the imam could have come and talked um, alongside uh, the religious side of things. Um, there were also a lot of devices and things that, are, that the chaplaincy offer, like Quran cubes, where um, the Quran uh, recitation can be played and it's a source of comfort and healing to, to Muslim patients um, and even if the interpreter could have been brought in. So um, when family and Ibrahim were reflecting, they felt, um, you know, Ibrahim didn't really understand because of his language difficulties and especially the complexity of um, some of the medical diagnoses and things he didn't really understand what was happening happening to him in, in English. So bringing an interpreter just for the purpose of communicating what was happening, especially when family weren't there, would have been really valuable uh, for someone like Ibrahim and made him feel so much more comfortable as an inpatient um, and willing to engage and, and stay, stay longer if that was what was of benefit. Um, and yeah, a few more things to um, be aware of is, um, so this aspect is around um, adapting our manner um, with patients and um, also the things that we're using with patients. Um, so um, I think, first of all, just when you are meeting someone from a different background to you, just removing any preconceived notions or judgments um, around their lifestyle and their choices is, is really important. Um, you do often hear um, comments um, when people are introduced to a, a culture or um, a, a minority that they're not used to, um, that can be a bit flippant and uh, insensitive. So just being aware that, you know, um, there is so many perspectives out there and um, you should be respectful in the way that you discuss um, different people's values. Um, and even in your manner and the, the way you um, approach the patient can be quite important. And um, so with Ibrahim, when I first met him, it was quite obvious that he um, was trying to be more modest and respectful as um, our gender interactions in uh, the Muslim tradition. So he was uh, looking down, he wasn't giving uh, me eye contact, he was um, not talking much, he was letting his son talk for him. Um, and, you know, marked against most speech therapy assessments, that would be a deficit in social communication. Um, but it was the awareness of why he was acting the way he was that I was able to uh, make more effort to build a rapport to explain what I was assessing and um, why uh, you know I was here to help and um, 
just making it making him feel more comfortable and understand why he would need to engage um, in a different way was really important. Um, and it made me think of if a male physio or occupational therapist was going to work with someone like Ibrahim um, to test strength or grip. Um, just to be aware, if it was a female physio, he might not, you know, show the best that he could because of the, um, uh, you know, Muslim um, culture of um, a male and female not touching each other um, when they're not related. So um, it's not about a female physio not being allowed to work with Ibrahim, but it would be more about them trying to build the rapport more and make him feel more comfortable, even if that meant build, build it, bringing in a chaperone. Um, or um, you know, um, a family member to to make him feel more at ease. Um, so yeah, knowing your community can be really useful in terms of making um, it more fair and making the advice you give more um, applicable to them. Um, a medical doctor knowing who he's talking to, and, and um, for example, in the South Asian. Uh, culture, knowing the um, diet and lifestyle choices, they'd be able to give more preventative advice that's more appropriate to them. For example, diabetes awareness um, around sugar and cholesterol rather than, um, you know, information about alcohol and um, smoking, maybe. Um, and yeah, the next part is about the types of materials that we use. So. Um, for speech therapy, a lot of what we use is designed for very white middle class populations. Um, and I remember when even I started working, um, some of the assessments I was looking through, um, looking at social communication, um, had assessments on idioms, which is um, to do with like the phrase on, on this slide here, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And um, it's thought that understanding figurative language such as this um, is a predictor for academic success and um, effective communication. However, um, even with me being born in this country in English, being uh, the, uh, the language that I was educated in, that kind of language use would be done in um, my home language. And uh, I would have never had said that or heard of that. So I would have been marked down on that just because of my cultural background. So just being aware that not everyone's um, uh, linguistic input's going to be the same, and um, even if they are from the same intellectual background. Um, that kind of uh, information is useful to know for people like um, occupational therapists who use um, the routine mocker assessment for cognition, just to know that the linguistic concepts, the, um, the images, the um, language used in those will not be the same um, for everyone and you know the frequency that different people have heard some of these concepts will be different in terms of like the names lion, rhinoceros, camel and some of the tasks that are done there will be more routine for, for some people than others so it's not fair to compare um, everyone with the same assess assessment um, and, and just being aware of that and thinking of how to adapt it. So I've used um, uh, a picture from a resource that one of um, my lecturers at university devised um, who worked with children from Pakistani heritage backgrounds and um, it made me think of working with a stroke patient with um, significantly reduced cognition who you know if they were working at a, a, le a, a level as simple as trying to map um, language back to simple meanings and concepts then being able to see pictures that related to them more, such as, um, you know, South Asian people with the skin colour, the dress, doing activities that they're used to with features that they're used to would be, uh, would they be able to relate to it more than um, some of the common uh, picture scenes that we use, for example, a man and a dog walking across a canal scene, or even in the pack that Ibrahim was given for phrase completion, there was, one of the answers was a bottle of wine. So just thinking about what would be more useful for them in terms of getting them back to, to their baseline. Um, and yes, the next part um, is joint goal setting. So um, uh, rig when I met um, Ibrahim, um, I could see quite obviously that his his goal was to pray and he was quite clear on that's what he wanted to do and that's what he wanted me to work with. He didn't understand the reason for um, going back to um, English speech sounds, working on meh, and ba. It sounded childish to him and babyish to him and he didn't really 
wanted to do that. He wanted to skip ahead uh, to, to the um, to the praying side, but um, it was through you know goal negotiation and explaining the rationale behind therapy and the evidence base and, and that kind of thing where he was able to understand that working on both the impairment um, and his functional goals um, would get him to be able to, to, to pray again. And this kind of um, technique would be really useful in terms of getting patients who aren't compliant with medications to, to understand why they need to take medications. Um, and also just for dignity of patients to feel like they are part of, of the therapy process. Um, I just wanted to give a really good example I've seen in the acute setting of um, uh, accommodation that was made for a Muslim patient. Um, so it was Ramadan and um, a, the patient was dysphagic and, and peg fed. Um, and someone came to me and asked me about the timings for fasting so that they could change the peg feed to run around that and overnight, which I thought was a really simple but such a respectful way to to care about what the patient cares about whilst looking after their health needs um so yeah just wanted to um so we made a therapy plan once we we set his goals and um i'll talk you through one of the first goals that we set so this one was working on his apraxia of speech um so we'd work firstly on um, improving articulatory precision of sounds at a phoneme word and sentence level uh, we worked on cell vowel sounds first and then bilabials and then consonants um, and then we work slowly to build up um, blending sounds and making up the single words that made, made up the adhan or the call to prayer. Um, and in this way, he was able to really see clearly why we were working on these generic tasks and how we would move to be able to say the call to prayer again. Um, and we did this for each of his prayer goals. So memorizing parts of the Quran and saying, making the, uh, learning the parts of prayer, uh, of the daily prayers and, um, you know, reading Arabic, um, we, we, we split that up um, so we so he was able to see how he would reach them um, through our therapy tasks. Um, and this same concept can be applied to other therapies as well. So when I was prepping for Ibrahim, I looked at what was already out there for post-stroke um, care for Muslims. And there was um, some international studies. This one's from um, Malaysia, where it looked at um, how for stroke patients, um, you know, salah or prayer was um, a, a big factor of, of their lives and uh, a really important issue for them. Um, so in terms of thinking how physios and OTs could have adapted for someone like Ibrahim, instead of doing a functional assessment looking at his ability to walk up the stairs, they could have done the postures of prayer. Um, and instead of like washing and dressing tasks, um, they could have done, you know, doing the ablution, which is um, some washing that we do before each prayer time. Um, so just thinking about how to do more functional and patient-centered um, goal setting there. Um, so before the community team came, um, we did some um, generic speech therapy task in English and then when they took over, I focused more on the, the Arabic side. Um, family didn't actually feel confident with the Arabic side, so they, I set them off looking at the English side, looking at the word finding difficulties, improving word retrieval and communication breakdown, um, and that really helped them to, to feel like they were part of the therapy process and helped Ibrahim form a good relationship um, with, with his family, especially when he, he was struggling to communicate with them at times. Um, and then really quickly, just to show you some more of, of the therapy that we did. So um, we looked at recognising letters again in Arabic and matching the letters to sounds. We then blended uh, vowel sounds to consonants and um, looked at joiners um, until we were able to, to put them together to accurately um, recite words and then phrases. Um, when we looked at performing the call to prayer and um, the memorised parts in the in the daily praying, um, I followed a simple and uh, popular speech therapy um, um, technique called script, script training, um, which is used for patients who sometimes have the goal to, um, you know, recite a speech in a wedding. Um, but I just adapted it to something that Ibrahim would be interested in. So we literally just practiced each sound um, until he said each word properly and then the whole passage um, until he was accurate saying that and confident doing that publicly. Um, 
actually I brought in a service of the Imam at this point, so he would send audio recordings um, of chapters um, in the Quran as well. Um, so Ibrahim would listen to that as some sort of auditory feedback um, in a similar way to music therapy um, for, for stroke patients. So um, that worked really well. Um, something we do in, in speech therapy to help like recognition of um, phonemes and, and graphemes is um, looking at recognising spelling patterns, so word initial phonemes, um, rhyme awareness, looking at the odd one out. So I basically did that, but just with Arabic words. Um, so in, in this example, the first two rhyme and the second two rhyme and he had to spot, you know, which which word started up with which letter. Um, so just a really simple way of adapting therapy. Um, and if you didn't have a background in Arabic, you could get an interpreter to, to work through some of these examples for you and they would have that linguistic knowledge. Um, and reading Arabic independently was um, a bit more um, complex for him with the level of alexia he had. but. Um, a common therapy technique is just focusing on a passage that's important to you when you read and just learning to read that um, specifically with some gains in generalization. So we did that with Ibrahim for um, a chapter of the Quran that was important to him. Um, and yeah, I think we'll stop there in terms of examples. We did um, about eight months um, of, of therapy um, and Hopefully you'll see him at the end um, explain his his side of it as well. Um, but what does all this mean for 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 stroke care? Um, hopefully we can see what culturally responsive care can look like. Um, you know there are so many different demographics out there and um, so many different therapies that we know. It's just about knowing how to, how we could better respond to serve that with with the knowledge that we know. Hopefully you can see through Ibrahim as well how being so functional with goal setting and being so patient centred can improve outcomes so much. Um, when he was an inpatient, he had very low mood, low in engagement, uh, family were really concerned about him. Um, when he was home, he wasn't doing much in terms of, of lifestyle as well. Um, but as soon as he had this focus and, and this goal of praying um, alongside therapy, he really, uh, you know, flourished in other areas as well. Um, and also, I hope you can see how everyday treatments that we are trained to do professionally can be adapted for individuals um, and how it doesn't have to be a one size fits all. Um, so here we saw the example of how bilingual, bilingual patients can be um, treated or even the role of spirituality and rehabilitation as well. Um, the takeaway message. The main one is um, based on even Fahim's um, presentation at the start is to research and know your community. So by choosing to work and serve an area, we should be aware of the cultural norms of the main demographics we see. We can't know everything about everyone, but if we do happen to come across a patient that has needs, we, sh we should feel confident to be able to, to research and ask questions and um, connect with people who do have more information so that we are delivering equitable care. Um, continue delivering standard evidence-based care, but adapting it to meet the needs of patients. Um, hopefully you can see how involving other services could be really useful. So um, charities, professionals, members of the communities. In my example, it was interpreters, imams, um, and then the knowledge I had of, of Arabic as well. Um, and the importance of promoting diversity in teams shouldn't be looked over as well. So um, knowing that different people bring so many different opinions and um, insight and ideas and um, I feel like there's a way to go for, for allied health professionals in particular. Um, you know, we often reflect in, in speech therapy as well. It's a very white profession, um, but linguistics, you know, and loss of language after a stroke is, is across all languages. So thinking about how to promote teams to be more diverse and recruit people from different backgrounds to be able to offer different insights as well is really important. Um, and yes, um, just to reflect on a few more things um, of how we can transfer it to, to other communities. So um, this was focusing on Muslim patients, but some other work that I'm doing with the rabbi at Fairfield is looking at how to improve um, the experience of, of Jewish patients after a stroke. So um, 
you know, currently the kosher options for dysphagia diet, such as puree, um, is very limited and it's really affecting, um, you know, oral intake and uh, well-being in the hospital. So thinking about how to make them kind of areas more fair and equal for, for patients. Um, and even another example for Jewish community communities that I've seen is around um, topics like risk feeding, where, you know, for usually there's a usual pathway for feeding decisions in the hospital, um, where if a person's approaching end of life or, um, you know, short term alternative feeding isn't suitable, um, you know, we, we approach it from an end of life uh, pathway view where we stop the non oral nutrition um, and allow a, a more natural death process. But um, in my example, um, you know, Jewish um, members of our community um, want to continue full nutrition till the end. And um, we can't approach that conversation in the same way we would approach it for other populations. It's important to consult the rabbi and um, um, religious leaders and really understand where they're coming from and what's important to them in terms of the care for their family members. Um, so that's just an example of a different um, re religious community um, that has work to be done in terms of stroke care. Um, a couple of resources that I'm going to leave here, just two very different ones um, that I thought were a good starting point. So the first one is um, on a similar vein to the kind of presentation I did today. So it's a podcast by the MDT um, team um, looking at different professionals talk about different cultural and religious practices around death. Um, I found it really useful to think about um, some of the things that I see in the acute setting and um, how to be more respectful and um, adapt, um, you know, my approach to these kind of populations. Um, and yeah, I think it's really useful to, to see how the professionals talk about um, what's what's normal for different cultures and um, and how um, the NHS can can work around some of those. Um, and the second one is the implicit Bi implicit bias test, which is a project designed alongside um, Harvard, um, looking at uh, a more reflective um, practice of um, seeing what um, what barriers we put up basically um, in in terms of our biases and reflecting on how we can improve and, and change and being aware of what comes natural to us um, and how to work on that f um, so we can deliver better care for our patients. Um, yeah, I think that is what we'll end on. Um, we are going to show a little bit about Ibrahim now, and um, I hope uh, you can take something from his, his story and reflect on how um, we can care better for people like Ibrahim. And um, yes, please do feel free to ask any questions in the uh, Q&A session at the end as well. Thank you. My name is Ibrahim Khan. I'm a 75 year old. I was born in India, but been here 60 years, <laughs> almost my my country now. <laughs> Before I retire, I, I've done about 40 years in the market, the market where I was. <laughs> my name is Maxwell Khan and I'm uh, Ibrahim's son. Throughout his life, he's been a uh, very independent. He used to work for British Airways, and at the same time, he used to do markets. He's a frequent traveller. He used to go to Umrah almost every year, um, India every two years. And um, he's very independent. He's got the gym, drive around himself. I was in a surgery, and the first thing was I couldn't talk to the receptionist. Yeah, so I thought, well, you know, what's happening, you know? And then I fell. There, yeah, I had a stroke. The consultant explained to my dad that he had a stroke, and they showed me the scan of his brain where there was like a grey area there, which they said that was the impact of the stroke. They said we're going to check him in. Liam and the, once you checked him in into the, at the bed, that was it then. I wasn't given any more information. I was just given a phone number to ring with dad. Um, and that's about it really. I wasn't explaining what was going to happen and how long it was going to keep him in, or what his medication was going to be. Not a single question about his cultural or religious needs. Food-wise, yes. They give me halal 
Are we talking about the inside of hospital? Man, yeah. But uh, regarding the prayer, I wasn't that in the position to pray. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the hospital, you know, like uh, priest or uh, imam, mm -hmm. to, uh, to me it would be a really big help. And even now, I'm, I'm going to say for the oh, pe pe people future, if anybody go to hospital, you know, they, being a Muslim, they need a big help for that. While my dad was in hospital, the communication was quite poor, if I'm honest. Um, he was there for three weeks, and we all we only are allowed to see him only on two occasions. Um, and it was just, the communication was poor, and not just myself, to my dad as well, because I think, I don't think they were communicating to him um, what's going on. Because every time I call my dad, my dad used to ask me what's happening, what's happening. And I was like, okay, we were telling him what we knew, but it was just a bit sad that no one in the hospital was able to solve, especially someone with probably the same language. Because when my dad had a stroke, um, he reverted to Urdu as a stronger language. And that would, if someone there would have been a consultant or even a nurse who's speaking Urdu on a daily basis, that would help my dad a lot. I've, I've told you, Mr. One of my our prophet name was Muhammad, and my grandson name also Muhammad was as well. This is how we started. Yeah. So this is an example of communication where my dad tried to communicate to us and to the nurse and how he his motive is how his memory, how his motivation to get things done and, and trying to get messages across. The first example is he was having a conversation with the nurse uh, about his grandchildren. And obviously he couldn't remember the names. So in order for the nurse to understand or to know the name of one of his grandchildren, my dad said, one name is the prophet of Islam. Um, and the nurse knew straight away he was talking about Muhammad. So that's how he communicated to the nurse that one of his grandchildren is named Muhammad. She so wanted to know about what I used to before. So I've told him I, I was a market trader. Yeah. So she said, oh, I, I'm, where, where do you do market? I said, I was doing it in Bolton and Wigan. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm from Wigan as well. <laughs> like, all right, that's good, yeah. And then she wanted to know now what, you know, I, how I give azan and all that. So she wanted to know all about the azan. He ran me up, and my, my wife was on the phone as well, loudspeaker, and he was communicating to me that he wanted to learn Asura. And obviously he forgot the name, he forgot what I it is, so he had to he had to sort of tell me that I want to learn the surah. So he said to me that Prophet Palestine. Okay, that's one thing he said. And the second thing he said is fish. And then we knew straight away that he's talking about the surah when the Yunus al Islam was in a whale's belly. Um, and that's the surah, and he wanted to know that surah. But because he couldn't remember the or he could remember remember the Yunus, the name of Yunus al Islam. That's how he communicated to me in order for him to learn a surah. So what I did then is that um, I got the Imam of the mosque to ring my father on his mobile at, at the hospital and the Imam of the mosque re basically recited it 25, 30 times. And that helped my dad learn a surah again. Through family and friends, we um, got in contact with a speech therapist who voluntarily helped us achieve his goals. I know his, his ultimate goal was to give azan again, to pray namaz again to read the Quran again, go back to the mosque again. Because that's, at that age, especially that age when he's 75, 70, you know, 74, 75, the most, you know, the most thing that matters to them is religion uh, and family, of course. But religion really is forefront of my dad. And he was, I can tell he was getting upset being at home because not going to the mosque five times a day was getting him a bit upset. He was getting a bit depressed in that sense. I can tell that he needed that focus. Then when the therapist himself came in and that gave him a drive, it was like, is that, the goal he had was to get back to the mosque and with that help, with your help, he actually achieved that goal, alhamdulillah. When I come from to a home, all I was not to know is the uh, religious sub, it's uh, being a Muslim, Quran and prayer, that's something I was really completely forgot, which, uh, which I was doing every day and that's something I've just forgotten. Even now, I, I find it very hard to read the Quran. As I was saying, his goal was to give us on. So within five months, he was doing that, alhamdulillah. Uh, by the time when he destroyed, he forgot everything. He forgot everything, including the Quran, the namaz, recitation. Um, but with, with, with the help of the therapist, that absolutely helped him. And you know, now he's back to going to namaz, giving us on, alhamdulillah, he's independent, eating himself. He's now, inshallah, inshallah, we're going to intend to go umrah in March. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine, yeah. Although I'm not going five times a day, but I'm doing three times now. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Hi everyone, thank you very much for attending the webinar and listening to uh, our three presenters. Um, our three presenters are here now um, to accept um, all of your questions. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A uh, section uh, right now and we'll be able to pause them to, to our presenters. Thank you. I'll just introduce all the presenters again. Um, so we have Khadija, who uh, was one of our presenters and uh, helped with the patient story. And we have Deepak here. Hi, Deepak. Hello. And we have Carol here as well. Hello, everybody. Hi. We have um, uh, Madhura, who's also from the Stroke Association. So if you have any problem, um, questions about the listening project she's here to talk about and discuss that as well um so for the first question i'm going to ask um khadija um so khadija um, one of the questions was um how what kind of factors would be important to research when trying to learn more about a certain culture um yeah so i feel like we discussed some examples with the specific story of ibrahim but um when we're thinking of culture there's a useful model that looks at like an iceberg so culture can be some hidden aspects things like um you know values social norms um gender roles um how you express emotions that kind of thing um and then and then some more um, overt things, so things like diet, um, art, music, um, um, dress, that kind of thing. So I think those are just some examples of different things to research that would be useful. Um, knowing a little bit about spirituality, their belief in like higher powers, um, if they're in control, that kind of thing, um, education levels, um, social norms, that kind of thing. I think and all those areas would be really useful to look into um, different demographics. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that, Khadija. Thank you. Um, and the question, next question um, is for Carol. Um, so, Carol, um, how how do we develop and deepen conversations with service users about cultural aspects of their identity? Um, well, if you're working in stroke services, I think maybe your starting point would be your the information you've you've gathered either through conversation or through um, the people have brought in from this for the SNAP data. Even though that's not ideal, it might be a, a useful starting point, and then be able to then use that as as um, your means to ask relevant questions around some of the things that they've identified maybe from the the forms they've filled in um and that are that 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 give you a sense of what's important to them i think it's it's re it is really important to set a context around the person-centered approach that deepak and Kajida have, have both you know discussed so you, you this is for the, you know what to get to for us to get to know people better so the conversations that you're developing with people which might be over a period of time um, not specifically or solely about the service and what the service needs in terms of data collection but also about better getting to know that person as an individual and what's important to them as well. So I think it's a series of conversations with key questions that you might ask um, around the um, other aspects of their protected characteristics that inform and are part of their cultural identity. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you. Um, and we've got one question uh, for Deepak as well. Um, Deepak, what are the challenges that you might have faced when uh, dealing with stroke patients from a diverse ethnicity, ethnicity and how did you overcome them? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And again, uh, I've already alluded to some of the things that we have already talked about, for example, related to uh, the perceptions of the culture and whether it's about uh, having a, a male to a female 
uh, therapist or a female therapist to a male patient. So again, it's understanding the cultural norms. We are not saying that it stops, as I think Adija already mentioned. It doesn't matter that you are a male physiotherapist or a female occupational therapist. It doesn't stop you from providing it as long as you have uh, the appropriate measures in place. For example, speaking in involving family members in there, doing your own research of what it is and having a chaperone or uh, leading to the charity or professionals or imam if that is what needs to. So yes, that's one thing. How I have been able to overcome it, I would say do your first research. And I think I don't just think that if people are not engaging with the service, uh, don't leave them. That's the first thing. Try and engage and understand. And there might be a particular reason behind it as well and increase your own awareness, whether it's about uh, uh, cultural awareness or biases or understanding whether it's the language which is a barrier or the system that they are not able to. So do some of your research. You may have to do work on your own skills a little bit more so that you can understand what the reasoning behind it as well. So that's how I was able to do it. Build that rapport. So you have to tr building the trust is the most important thing. If you can build the trust and I think that is important principle for anybody to see building that trust and having that rapport will help you to uh, open open conversation and having that it will be very, very difficult. I think culturally there are some questions that people may feel they're not confident in asking. By all means, it happens that and as a clinician, as a professional, you will have that conversation and you may feel it's uncomfortable. So making sure that you have a safe space so you can actually reach out to the networks, for example, a BAME network or LGBTQ network of your trust or organization, even at regionally, nationally, anywhere, even your team members and making sure that you have an opportunity. Uh, and again, no silly. It's not a silly question you're asking. You're trying to improve your knowledge about some of the aspects, but having providing that safe space will help you. You may, as we have already said, you don't have to be experts in every cultural background or religion or aspect of it, but you know where to go or having a supervision speaking to your manager or the network member may help you, which can actually be life changing for a patient that you're looking after. So these are the things just which help me personally in dealing with different aspects. I'm not saying I'll expert in everything, but I have sought help and able to help the patient at the end. So hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. Thank you. Um, and I've got um, a question for Khadija. Do you think there's um, we need to devise almost like a clinical tool to maybe help some of our professionals to look specifically at um, or help them when dealing with uh, a patient um, who have a different ethnicity or a different culture? Do you think that would be useful to clinicians and how do you think that would help them? Yeah, I think we've talked like informally about like a checklist that would be really useful to devise on the back of this of just, you know, main parameters to look out for just to check that you are covering all bases. Um, so I, I do think that like a tool would be really useful just to kind of um, as a starting point when you really don't know where to start. Um, I think also just uh, the reflective side as well that um, Carol started talking about things like looking at your own biases and your own um, awareness within yourself. So um, after the Black Lives Matter movement, we kind of as a team started to look at um, our privileges and um, where, where we're starting from, where we've come from and how that affects how we're treating people as well. So looking at, um, you know, how to be. Sorry. Um, and yeah, we kind of went through this checklist just to reflect on um, our experiences um, as well. I could read you if you did have some saved here, but we kind of, um, yeah, looked through this checklist. We kind of had, had our hands up and um, we put them down if we'd experienced this and we saw how everyone in the room had different experiences. Things like people know how to pronounce my name. Um, I'm never mocked or asked to repeat myself. Um, I'm not threatened by the police because I know they're there to protect me. Um, I do not have to worry about being chosen last for a job due to my ethnicity. Um, uh, I can start a new job and know that most people around me will look like me. Just them kind of questions. I think some people hadn't even considered that was different for other profession, other people in the profession. So just having that kind of awareness within like a, a team setting um, and then knowing 
that patients will feel similar as well and, and thinking about how to adapt similar questions for them would be really useful. Thank you, Khadija. That, that's, that's amazing. I think we've tried to base this on cultural awareness and rehabilitation needs, but I think I think we possibly need to target this from a professional point of view and and how culture sits within the team as well um, and how people's team interactions are, are important. And, and this this specific tool that you're talking about could be could be almost the answer of, of a team building exercise that we do around culture, even just within our team, because I think, you know, it's uh, important to acknowledge um that awareness as well um so it's yes you don't know what you don't know kind of things so yeah. until you're, you're brought up with these kind of questions to to like challenge the way you've been thinking forever you're never gonna really know um you know other ways of thinking or experiences yeah have any of the other presenters got a, a comment or anything on that mm. yeah carol okay i think Yeah, I was I was on mute. <laughs> I'm OK yeah, now. Okay. Yeah, I think with, within um, psychology, we use certain frameworks um, that can, might be useful. So we use. So, for example, there's something called the addressing framework, which is more it's more directed at, um, so, you know, sort of counselling psychotherapists. But I think it can be it can be more broadly used. So addressing is just an acronym for the different characteristics that you that you um, you might and you might use it as a tool so that so just for example addressing is like the age developmental history disability religious and um religious and spiritual orientation ethnicity and various other elements but you but you kind of think of the conversations um within teams or you know within you know if you're doing a self reflection in terms of that addressing framework and there's another framework called the social graces um, which I think is more common to, to commonly used in the UK, but similar looking at the characteristics like like um, gender, race, etc., and, and different characteristics. So that's one way of of doing it. Um, but you can we can also think in terms of a cultural formulation, um, which is which helps you in for rehabilitation to think about. Um, the components are like ass assessing cultural identity, ex including cultural explanations of illness, etc., and determining cultural factors related to, to the environment. These can be parts of a team discussion as well as discussions with the service users on the, ind on the individual basis. So having frameworks for the discussions, um, for reflection, for reflective discussions as well as having a checklist as well of, of um, key areas to cover uh, might be helpful. So we have just got uh, an event. Thank you to all our presenters. They've been absolutely amazing.